the power and the glory of Farm Alaska and DMT experienced by Netrunner on Eurowood. Farm Alaska was what they were calling it. Two 75 milligram Harmaline tablets, four 10 milligram 5-MeO DMT chasers, totaling 40 milligrams. What the hell, I thought. I'm in the jungles of Mexico, in Palenque. I'm surrounded by experienced psychonauts and an ethnobotanical conference. What's the worst that can happen? Be prepared to die, our source told me, grimly earnest. Yeah, I thought, like a major mushroom trip, right? I felt I was ready. Not quite. In all, there were nine of us forming a circle in one of our rooms with mattresses and pillows laid out for all of us. My brother sat across from me. Two of the nine were experienced with ayahuasca and became our leaders. Before consumption, each one of us stated our intent, out loud or to ourselves. Mine was to experience spiritual consciousness. Rather vague, this being my first time with this class of substance. I'm sure of how long the wait between Harmline and 5-MEO. We decided 20 minutes should be plenty. Later we were told the quantities were designed for a simultaneous consumption of the both the Harmline and 5-MEO tablets. Some of us took the entire dose. Some took half. I was 24, 5'10", 115 pounds. We decided to take the entire dose, being my first and perhaps only opportunity. When in doubt, double the dose, to quote Terence McKenna, a well-loved, experienced shroomer. The effect of the harmaline were subtle, energizing, like a beetle nut buzz. Twenty minutes later, I ingested all four or five MEO DMT tablets. What follows is both from memory and the account of others. It came in waves, strong, soporific, deep intoxicating waves, building in intensity like watching a storm build up on shore. Stronger, stronger, stronger. Some of us started chanting, singing. Some softly moaned with the pleasure of insight. I felt queasy, nervous, not quite nauseous at this point. I remained silent, focusing on my breathing to calm myself. I started trembling, cold gradually warming up, feeling her, the spirit of ayahuasca, calling, wanting to take me. I felt myself slowly giving in, retreating, giving in, unsure of where I was headed. What have I gotten myself into? I asked myself. This was not what I expected at all. This was much, much, much deeper and unlike anything I'd ever experienced. This was only the beginning. I was soon to learn. The experience had not really fully started yet. I laid down on my pillows and draped my arm over my eyes to block out the candlelight. It was around 11 p.m. when we started. I remained focused on my breathing, staring into the black of my arm, feeling my brain, my mind sink into a warm, absolute void outside my body. I was so focused on my breathing, I didn't notice the void at first, and when I did I sat up with a start and slowly settled back down, trying to ease myself into it. The first waves of nauseousness started to creep up on me, and I increased my breathing rate, deeper, harder, almost to the point of hyperventilation, until the experience had drawn me in even further. I started to sink, sink, and sink through my body, through the ground, my body going limp, numb. My breathing was still strong, hard, almost frantic, obvious to everyone around me. I was losing my connection with my body, and it was impossible to tell if I was breathing enough or too much. My thinking mind, my inner voice began to fade. I couldn't concentrate on words, but rather only abstractions of very deep, complex ideas. I just knew things without thinking them. 
like ideas were being fed directly to me, from me. My breathing rate increased, approaching hyperventilation without my realizing it at first. One of the leaders crept up to me silently with Agua Florida, also known as Rose Water, which he sprayed across my chest and face from his mouth. I started to snap back and became aware of my breathing but seemed unable to control it. He laid his chest on mine. Follow my breathing, he said, and forced my chest to breathe with his. I relaxed, slowed my breathing, became more aware of my surroundings, pulled back from the black. He retreated back to his mat rather quickly. I fell right back into the inky black void, like a deep, dreamless waking sleep, drifting, swimming, sinking. I drifted for what felt like an eternity, my mind dissociating deeper, deeper, the deepest of dreamless sleeps. It lasted for an eternity, me swimming in and out of it, vaguely aware, numb, drugged. And then I woke. I sat up, and everyone around me was laying down, quiet, still, seemingly asleep. Some stirred or twitched, like coming down from extra shrooms while trying to sleep. It was over. It felt like four to six hours had passed, and I felt extremely rested, aware, awake. It appeared lighter out. Dawn was approaching, it seemed. There was a slight crackling of energy around me. Visual hallucinations of colored points of light and a static textile grid-like pattern. Similar but different from shrooms. I looked at my watch. Only 15 minutes had passed. Uh-oh, I thought. That was just the beginning, the first wave. I wasn't quite sure what to do. Lay down, walk around, what? I stood up and nervous anxiety started to creep up on me. I pushed it away, annoyed at my seeming inability to get into it. Relax, let it take me. Open eye visuals seemed stronger but still vague. When I closed my eyes, there was nothing but inky black. I felt a dozen contradictions all at once. I felt like I needed to take a leak. Now I didn't, now I did. I went to the bathroom, sat down, relaxed my bladder and stared through the wall. I started to be taken away and being pulled fast and hard and strong. I resisted, pulled back. I didn't need to pee after all it seemed. I stood up a little dizzy, stared back to my pillows. My brother turned the corner, checking up on me. Hi, he said, how you doing? He seemed almost alien. I almost didn't even recognize him, and yet he was the most familiar thing in the world at the same time. Good, I responded, holding my arms tight against me, cold again, nervous. Impulsively, I hugged him, tight, almost clinging. I didn't realize how scared I was until then. Wow, I said. I made it back to my pillows, laid down. She took me fast, much stronger, much harder than the initial wave. The first wave was nothing. I lost all awareness of my body, my surroundings, everything around me. I felt myself fall right through the earth like a neutrino, like the earth was nothing but empty space. I left my body completely and dissolved in the universe. My mind became placed into the mind of the universe expanded into it, knowing everything to be known, but completely unable to think in thoughts, words, or my mind voice was completely gone. Yet I was completely aware of ideas, knowledge, wisdom, abstractions, which were so perfectly clear and understandable to me outside of any known constructs of language, way beyond language, completely nonlinear thought and yet not thought, just knowing pure knowing. My mind, my consciousness, my poor little brain struggled to keep up with it, struggled to keep up with everything streaming in, 
struggled to fit the mind of the universe within it. She spoke to me, tried to calm me, tried to explain. You're dying, she said. You're dying. Isn't it beautiful? And I was. I felt myself, my mind, me, turn inside out again and again. It came in waves, slow imploding inward waves which twisted and folded me inside and out again and again. And each time was a death, a shocking, terrifying, incredibly beautiful, intense, joyful, incredibly profound death. I died over and over and over hundreds of times that night all while she tried to coax me show me teach me love me i felt like arjuna in the bhagavad gita when krishna reveals himself in his full glory only the brilliance was all in thought there were no visuals just pure inky black emptiness void something in me wouldn't break though something in me held back even still after all those deaths it wasn't just fear, it was love. I want to give her my heart, my emotion, my pain, my core. She gently pulled and tugged. Let go, she said, just let, just go. let go. I started to feel my connection to my body again, faintly as if through a dark shrouded, distant, unreal dream, completely alien to me. My body started flexing back but my breathing built in intensity from very slow and very deep to hard, intense, forceful breaths, approaching hyperventilation, seemingly beyond my recognition of control rather than my ability. My body was alien. The physical realm was alien. I couldn't cope with it. I opened my eyes. I sat up sharply. I gasped. Everything seemed alien but not because I didn't recognize things or people. It was as if I was seeing everything for what it really was, rather than how I perceived things as a human with human senses. Everything spoke to me on a different level. I started to panic. The physical realm was alien, my mind was alien. There was nothing of comfort, nothing I recognized as real and true as I'd always known them. I jumped up and accidentally stepped on someone's foot. <sighs> Empathy washed over me in waves. I couldn't stop apologizing. The owner of that foot took one look at me and gave me a hug, asked if I needed anything. Speech, words, ideas. I grasped for that part in my mind, struggled to communicate, fell into her eyes, her soul, saw her very inner being felt her love and compassion wash over me. I don't know, I whimpered. I don't know. I don't know. Do you want to go outside? I don't know. I looked at the door, outside. It seemed so vast, so open. The jungle out of the back porch. I could feel the cooler air streaming in. Yes, I said. I stumbled outside to my shock. The plants, the trees were so alive. They were so alien, I could feel them. I knew them, I, I knew they were alive, feeling sentient beings, completely alien to anything I've ever experienced, even shrooms. I recognized them as plants. I recognized their shapes, but everything else was alien. Their personalities spoke to me, comforted me in eerie, knowing silence identified with me, felt sorry for me. My brother came and stood next to me, trying to evaluate my state. You okay? Again, I struggled for words. I tried to evaluate my emotions to little avail. I don't know, I whimpered. I don't know. Do you feel sick? He asked. The mere suggestion washed waves of nauseousness over me. Yes, I said. Do you want to throw up? Yes. I thought it would make me feel better. Purge myself. Start the cycle down. I tried throwing up. It didn't work. Put your finger down your throat, my brother softly suggested. I put what felt like my whole hand down my throat and retched over the railing into the forest. 
My body felt better at first, and then... Whoosh, the strongest wave yet washed over me, pulled me in, captured me. I was in purgatory, stuck between the physical and mental realm, not comfortable in either, afraid of both. Please, I whimpered. Please, 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 please. By this time, everyone started gathering around me. I looked into each one of them, supplicating with a please. At first whimpering and then stronger and stronger, more and more forced. Please, please. They formed a tight circle around me, hugging me in turn, trying to figure out what I needed, how to help me. Please what, dear? Please what? The question perplexed me. I didn't know. Just please, please. The waves washed over me. My body went limp after each passing one, and after each one I would stand rigid and force a please, more and more insistent. My awareness of the physical realm starts to fade from here, but I remember yelling please at the top of my lungs, and then supplicating and then whimpering. How can I live knowing what I know? How can I live feeling what I felt? How can I live seeing what I've seen? How can I live? How can I live? I don't remember saying all of this. It was just related back to me afterwards. I felt like I was pulsing, throbbing, glowing with energy. My gaze stared through each person with fierce intensity. I looked through each person. Only a few held my intense gaze looking through them, literally feeling my ability to pull them into me, into the intensity of my experience. Some started pulling away as I pulled them into me. I could feel their anxiety as they realized, felt what I was going through, where I was. Do you want to lay down, they asked me. They motioned to my pillows. I looked at my pillows uncertainly. It seemed comforting. I started to relax and let them start to lay me down. Another imploding wave of death washed over me as I let myself relax and sink into it. No, please! I snapped back to rigid attention. Exhausted with the extreme physical and mental exertion it required for me to maintain a connection to the physical realm. I started clinging to some of them, wrapping my entire body, arms, and legs around them, especially the rose water leader. He seemed to be the only one to know how to respond, strong enough mentally to contain me. He forced me to stand on my own, forced my arms at my sides. I threw some scornful pleases in his direction, but he didn't flinch. My body would go completely limp in waves pulling me back in and he shouted at me, no, 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 no. He forced me to remain standing. He became stern but warm, full of love and compassion. The others backed off, only catching me if I started to fall. It was just me and him in the standoff. Please, please, I directed at him. A wave would wash over me and I would start to fall, then jump, stamp, force myself to attention hold my chin up proudly when I was able to stave them off. Please, I directed at him again, proudly. He comforted me. This is this you, you, he said, touching my chest. Feel the power. This is, this is you. you. I would start to go limp. No. This is you. This is you. Feel your power. Feel your power. Feel your power. I stamped the ground again with my feet, looked up. I was mentally exhausted, absolutely exhausted, barely clinging on. I've seen you before, he said. I know, I thought, in my state. I know you all. I am you. I know you, he said. I've seen you before. The other started murmuring in agreement from behind me. You look Christ-like, Christ -like, he said. I accepted it without question. It was obvious to me in my state, I was Christ. I was God. The energy, the confidence, the power, the love in me began to surge. I felt it expand around me, encompassing everyone. 
It became very quiet, very still, just me standing there, breathing, pulsing, glowing. I let my guard down. I relaxed my shoulders, my body slightly. I was regaining control. I was becoming me again. I breathed the biggest, deepest, most comforting breath of my life. Thank you, I said to my leader. Thank you, I turned to each one. Thank you. No, thank you, the leader said to me, as I noticed each one of them started to come down, relax, and breathe. The power of ayahuasca was definitely with you tonight, my friend, he said, relieved to have me back. For those moments, they had become me. They were me. I had them trapped in my attention, in my mind. Every one of them a vivid picture in my mind, and I could feel myself letting them go one by one. I hugged them all. Two or three hours had passed. They walked me outside to the front this time, and under the moon, under the stars, was a megalithic rock garden. The igneous rocks seemed perfectly arranged in a perfect harmony to each other, pulsing with energy, alive, knowing, watching, greeting me. I walked around them in circles, slow, slow circles, greeting each one blessing each one as I passed by. Everything I saw I blessed internally or with a thank you. I blessed the moon, the stars, the planet, the air, the rocks, each person, myself, my surroundings, the night. A few stayed with me, watched me quietly, followed me, caught in my spell. I would inscribe circles around them each in turn as I circled around the rock garden. Circles, 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 first one way, then the other. I felt so calm, so peaceful, so beautiful, so alive. I sucked the life energy of the air into me. I could feel my blood capture it. I could feel it course through my body. I could feel it being released. I could feel the energy flowing through me. I could hear the energy flowing through me. I basked in my own internal fire, remembering all my college science, religion, philosophy lessons, knowing them, realizing them, feeling it all happen, feeling it all make so much beautiful sense and harmony. There seemed to be rising commotion coming from inside. Eventually, slowly, I made my way back in. One of the other participants got stuck, but a different place than me. He became extremely violent and yelling and whimpering. I don't understand, over and over. He was a friend who had just helped talk me down just a few minutes earlier. He was lashing out at things, people, clinging and digging into their flesh. I tried to talk him down, to let him recognize me. I let my mind enter that space, his space, ever so carefully. It worked for a little while. Until he clung to me with such tenacity, he began to hurt me, dig into my flesh, pull out clumps of my long hair. They helped pull him from me. He broke one person's glasses and bit another's thumb very severely to the bone. We weren't able to control him. He was lost. We brought him back home to his room one half a kilo away to let him come into peace and comfort. He remembers nothing of the violence. His down personality being completely unviolent and unantagonistic. The transformation was amazing. The other leader who had a gift for reading into people told me afterwards that he saw my heart swollen, huge, like it was ready to burst. He asked me to think about anything in my life that I needed to let go of or deal with. I was actually in the extremely intense, painful, and drawn-out process of breaking up with my girlfriend of several years. For the other guy, he said he saw a large insect-like being clinging to his head, holding on, talking to him. The leader talked with the insect to find out what he wanted. The insect said he was telling him what he needed to know. The leader told the insect to leave because we couldn't control him. The insect left and our friend became even more frenzied, 
So he called the insect back to calm him down, which eventually happened. The evening broke up with a rather weird energy after that. A lingering, indescribable, chemical-like taste or smell stuck with me for several hours afterwards as well as a kind of glowing, towel-like pattern before my eyes. Very indistinct. I made it back to my room, where I slept well that night. All in all, I consider this experience a positive and necessary one, which taught me what to expect from this class of substances and how to better prepare for any future consumption, including dosage. I'm still processing this experience many months later, as little by little my mind lets me remember more of it. Curiously, the distinct chemical flavor returns with the memories. Immediately afterwards and for several weeks, my mind wouldn't let me think about it. A strange and unique phenomenon for me. It was a full-blown psychological near-death experience, and that's how my mind remembers it, with trepidation. I'm curious to repeat the experience in due time, knowing what I know now. It was definitely the most profound experience of my life. The next evening, I got back on the horse and smoked some crystalline NMDMT for the first time. I heard 5-MeO-DMT referred to as the power and NMDMT as the glory. That is exactly how my experience fit with these two. My intent with this experience was to understand my experience of that night before. There was a group of six of us plus the supplier with the pipe. We were in one of our rooms on the beds. I was the second to last to try it. All the others had experiences lasting 10 to 15 minutes max. I inhaled three or four strong puffs, laid back, and fell through the bed. It came on very fast, very strong, extremely visual, the most visual of anything I've done. Eyes open or shut, and then completely unlike 5-MeO, which was barely visual, and strangely only with open eyes. It was out of body, and my body felt disconnected as the night before, somewhat tingly this time like when a limb falls asleep. Direction, orientation, gravity became meaningless in this completely abstract work of visual art. I found myself lying down in a room, surrounded by alien presences, standing all around me in my peripheral vision. The presences appeared to me as in alternate black and white outlines, and I could only see their heads peering down at me. They were featureless except for color and shape. A black head shape next to a white head shape next to a black head shape. Six to ten of them were very interested in me, but trying to stay out of my field of vision. In retrospect, I felt like I was lying on a hospital bed as a patient of these presences. Straight in front of me or above me in the distance was a rectangular box, slowly approaching. It was my reaction to the box the presences were most interested in. As I studied the box, I started to make out details. I was looking into the open side of the box, and along the top edge were about a dozen or so dancing snakes, weaving rhythmically back and forth, like seagrass rippling under the sea, and pulsing in rainbow psychedelic colors, mostly reds. It was absolutely hypnotic to watch, as they slowly approached with the open box below them. Slowly, my attention moved from the snakes to the contents of the box. On the left was a circular disc, quartered, with a black dot in each quarter, also pulsing and with rainbow colors. On the right was a round flask with a long neck and I quickly realized this was the most important of the objects being revealed to me. As I drew my attention to it, it slowly came towards me, open end into my mouth. I could feel the flask on my lips, in the physical realm which surprised me, and suddenly and involuntarily, I began to swallow again and again, drinking what felt like pure energy. As I began drinking from the flask, my field of vision was drawn into the contents of the flask. I zoomed in, closer and closer. 
until I realized with a start that I was drinking DNA. I could make out the strands and then the double helixes, and then as a single strand loomed to fill my vision, it began to unwind, and I followed the strands simultaneously in both directions at once, forward and backward in time, a strange but pleasant sensation. What followed was this incredible experience. I felt myself morphing into various species, all feeling very similar. It was not so much visual as it was what it actually felt like to be in the mind and body of first a fish, then a frog, then a snake, an eagle, a lion. I was experiencing the unfolding of life itself. As I had realized the night before and on other trips and meditations, that the story of life is not one of simple chance and contingency influenced so much by natural selection as we observe in the greater physical realm, but rather it is directed by a simple life force of pure energy, which operates on the smallest of conscious, sentient levels, down to the very molecules, atoms, even quarks, and smaller, where matter and energy blend and are really one and the same. All of it is conscious, the entire universe is conscious and connected, at every level and every size. And we are nothing more than manifestations, physical packages, containers of that pre-existing, everlasting, all-pervading consciousness. DNA strands are nothing more than books, physical mnemonics, stable energy forms of ideas and patterns that worked and are written saved and read back by this all-pervading life force. Working patterns of DNA are not simply selected by pure chance, as classic evolutionary theory would have us believe. It is being written and directed by something much greater, much more pervasive, and much more subtle than we've ever till now supposed. And this all-pervasive awareness is finally being realized in the West through quantum mechanics evolutionary theory, mythology, psychology, synchronicity, and most especially, psychonautics. But I digress. Slowly, my field of view returned back from the contents of the flask, back out to the snakes, approaching ever closer until I realized they weren't just snakes but sharp scythes, lashing out at me, cutting at my chest my heart, dancing ever so rhythmically, gently but necessarily, telling me to let go, open my heart, let go, let myself free. I opened my eyes. The room was nothing but paisley patterns and paisley people. My body was somewhat tense. I closed my eyes again. The snakes were gone, I couldn't see the presences, but I knew they were still there, watching me, protecting me. In the distance, a different presence began to approach me. A large red demon-like creature with knobby bulbous head and bulging arms and fierce but non-hostile eyes. His right arm and hand was outstretched, reaching for my head. He gently reached through my flesh, my skull, and gently palmed my mind like a blanket wrapped around my brain. Then he faded into dozens of eyes peering, turning, twisting, watching, which in part slowly faded into darkness. I opened my eyes, met the gaze of everyone else's eyes in the room. The feeling of the demon's palm and the presence of the protective entities didn't fade. They were meant to stay with me, and they have even now. Thirty to forty minutes passed, the longest that evening by far. I told my story quietly and slowly got up. I felt much relieved from my previous night's experience. The glory of DMT was ever so gentle, tender, compared to the power of 5-MeO-DMT. After the experience, incidentally, I ended up having to piss again and again that night, although I had not drank more liquids than usual, other than the contents of the flask and the vision. Weird. Several weeks later, still processing these two DMT experiences, 
I had one of the most realistic, vivid dreams I've ever had in my life. Christian Ratch once described these types of dreams as Kali dreams, after the Hindu goddess of mayhem and destruction. In my dream, I was a child again back in middle school, talking to a beautiful young girl who, in retrospect, looked like Parvati, who was a loving, gentle alter ego of Kali. Her gaze and awareness was piercing, focused, all-seeing, all-knowing. And her eyes looked straight into me and gave me a queasy, nervous, glowy feeling, like intense love at first sight. The class bell rang, and she started for the classroom along with all my classmates who were taking their seats. I had to go to the bathroom though, and knew the teacher wouldn't mind me being a little late. It was my favorite Spanish teacher, incidentally. Returning from the bathroom, I walked into an empty classroom. The back door was open though, and the sun and breeze were streaming in. It was eerily quiet. I stepped out the back door to find the bodies of my classmates strewn all over the lawn, bloody dead. Only a couple were still alive, catatonic, carefully loading the bodies into a sport utility. I stood there in shock, watching the scene, trying to figure out what had happened when I realized I was being watched. It was her, the beautiful girl, Parvati, Kali. She looked at me with the slightest of smiles, wide eyes, arms and palms turned out towards me, presenting the entire scene to me. With that gaze, I instantly realized she had done this. She did it as a lesson for me. She was trying to show me how beautiful death can be. She killed these children to teach me and to teach them the beauty and value of both life and death. She freed them, she let them go. She returned them to the eternal, all-pervasive, universal consciousness. It was a gift, her gift, her eternal, timeless lesson to us, to not hold on so tightly to such a precious gift as life and overlook the precious gift that is death. With this realization and her gentle, loving gaze, I was overcome with an overwhelming sense of peace, beauty, joy, despite my natural instincts of terror and revolt. The scene in the lesson before me was absolutely sacred and necessary. Callie had visited me. I opened my eyes and found myself wide awake in bed, remembering every vivid detail clearly.